Oh, let's see. Hopefully this works. It worked in the last one. We'll see if we get uh, this working as well. This will be uh, Apache Deep Learning 302. This is not the data science angle. This is running deep learning and machine learning as part of data engineering and data pipelines with Apache NiFi and Pulsar and other things. It is pretty straightforward. Uh, it, if you were in the NiFi session, it'll follow some of that up and has some NiFi in it. We'll get started in uh, a minute or two here, let people get on and uh, make sure you're in the right session. If you're not interested in any of that, this is probably not the session for you. Uh, but if you have questions on Pulsar, NiFi, uh, using uh, some MXNet, again, not a data scientist here, so I can't help you with all that cool stuff. But uh, I could show you how you might want to use it, how you might want to build pipelines, which is pretty cool. So if you're interested, stay. If you're not interested, uh, that's okay. <laughs> if you got to, uh, if you got to go uh, to another session, I'm not gonna feel bad here. <laughs> this will be recorded. You always come back watch it later. But I think we're about time here, so let's start up. So this is uh, Apache Deep Learning 302. Again, this is for data engineers and programmers. I've got a GitHub link down here. I'm going to copy this. I'll put this in the chat. This is uh, what I'm using today. There is uh, an open source uh, model server that works with MXNet and some other uh, frameworks. Let's it very easy for you to integrate this with other tools without having to do the heavy lifting. Now, I've written uh, a couple of deep learning processors for NiFi so you could do it natively. But calling these model servers makes it very flexible for you to be able to just drop in different models at different times without uh, having to recompile or redeploy things. And we'll cover some ancillary projects as well. This is me. Um, my day job is developer advocate at Stream Native. That's usually Apache Pulsar and Apache Flink. But I like a lot of uh, different open source projects, especially. Uh, Almost anything out of Apache, Spark, Flink, NiFi, Tika, Calcite, tons of different uh, Hadoop, ton of great uh, projects out there. I'm involved in a couple of talks. This is my last one for the day. Two is probably enough per day. Maybe two total. You know, sometimes if you put in too many talks, you get to do them. You know, lessons learned. Tomorrow, I've got one on real-time transit. That's writing apps to get real-time transit data with NiFi, Pulsar, and Flink. Kind of cool combination. Uh, we've got uh, some talks not by me on uh, Pulsar, which is really cool. I'm going to fix my slides real-time. I spelled my own name wrong. That's pretty bad. Uh, and so there's a couple of coming up. So stay here for every day of ApacheCon. Lots of cool content. Uh, if you want to run this, these cool things, and you don't want to run it all yourself, Stream Native has a way to run these real-time messaging and streaming in the cloud for you, whether it's maybe on-premise in Kubernetes or in Amazon, Google, Microsoft, Alibaba. Makes it easy to do that, as well as Flink SQL. Great way to run apps. And it is the full Apache stack down, Apache Pulsar, and the cool Pulsar functions, sources, and syncs, and Flink for doing that cool uh, SQL. Apache Bookkeeper's in there. Storage and computer separate. That's why you like to think uh, easy to scale out. Feature I really like is this tiered storage. At some point, extra stuff just goes to cheap... Uh, Unlimited storage, pretty cool way to do that. I've been calling my stack, if it's mine, uh, things I like to use together, the flip stack or the flipping stack, which is, I think is kind of funny. It's Apache Flink, Apache Pulsar, Apache NiFi. There's a connector in there to make that nice and clean. 
great Apache projects for doing streaming, data engineering, IoT, getting stuff through deep learning pipelines. And now those can be on my devices over here, like a Jetson or a Raspberry Pi, could be running on your laptop, could be running in Kubernetes, Docker, local uh, host, a thousand node uh, cluster in Amazon, VMs, wherever you're running it. As I mentioned, if you're a data scientist, I'm not gonna give you any new insights, but maybe you have to do your own data engineering. Hopefully you don't, but if you do, I'm giving you some help here on some of that. Uh, these are the three personas that kind of work uh, with what I'm doing. Data engineer, hopefully that's who you are, or you're a programmer, or you want to learn some data engineering skills. I think NiFi is part of that. If you're my cat, you already know ETL, so you're good. Uh, AI is running a lot of this. Today, AI will not do this talk. Tomorrow it might. We'll have to see. So what are we, uh, you know, lots of different things we could be orchestrating. Now for me, not a data scientist, but there's a ton of pre-built models. Some of them you could tweak with some retraining or putting your own data in there. Some of them you could just use off the shelf. And these are a ton of different things you could use, especially if it's attached to a device. Things like recognition, checking for motion, converting data to text. Again, getting that speech to text is a great uh, data engineering pipeline. Running a lot of different NLP on that text, whether you get it from Twitter, from chats, from wherever you're getting your text from. For me, I'm reading a series of my presentations. Boom, run that different analysis on there. You start building recommendations. Lots of things that as non-data scientists you could still uh, do. Break this down to the Apache projects. Flink gives me that continuous SQL. Flink can run machine learning and deep learning. Uh, it's not fully integrated. There's uh, some code efforts to do that. Uh, continuous ETL. Keep changing things so it's going where it needs to go and I don't have to wait. Ooh, that's where that was. There's like a phantom image in here. Boop. Real time. Another doll. Trying to edit stuff real time. There we go. Uh, these are the main frameworks I'm working with. Pulsar, having that buffering and messaging and having functions that can run machine learning. Now I try to orchestrate this, queue everything up, do that simple event processing. The main deep learning I'm doing is through Apache MXNet. Great Apache framework for doing deep learning. Runs pretty much everywhere. Uh, we're also using uh, DJL, which uh, sits on top of this and some other frameworks. Open NLP, if you haven't tried it yet, really nice Java framework for NLP. Very good for getting entities. So you throw data in there, give me my location, currency, names. These are things that are nice to be able to identify when you're doing some processing of data. Again, if you're taking raw data like logs, chat, message dumps, email, Twitter, or your own documents, being able to pull out some relevant information, maybe putting that into metadata, that may be more important for you than the actual text. Tika helps you automate a lot of this. It can run as a, its own uh, REST server, get you metadata, data conversion, analytics. This, this is a, a very useful tool and it's uh, performance. I highly recommend Tika. MXNet's the main story here today. It is a nice cloud ready framework. It is not TensorFlow, but it has pretty much all the features you'd expect there. It's written by the XJ Boost team, which is a great framework. It's backed by some major players. It's in Apache, runs on Kubernetes, runs anywhere you want. I've got it running on different NVIDIA devices, on Raspberry Pis, on Mac, wherever you're running it. Runs very easy. Typically, I like to do it with Python, very easy to do. Lots of documentation out there. They've added uh, additional layers on top of it to make it even easier. Gluon makes things pretty clean. You could use Keras if you're used to using that from TensorFlow. 
like I mentioned, the Python thing is pretty awesome. Model server will show you that some examples. Onyx, you know, the support for that in the world is hit or miss, but it is a nice way to have some way to exchange models. There's a lot of pre-built ones out there. If you're not a data scientist, which I am not, it's great to be able to download one of these and start using them without having to try to build your own from scratch, especially if you're doing any kind of uh, stuff with cameras. There's a ton of great ones out there. We're going to do cafe there for why not? So I've got an MXNet model server running there, and I'm going to interface with it with Apache NiFi just to show you how you can have this running in a data pipeline. It makes it very easy because I can run this uh, model server somewhere, whether that's in the cloud, Kubernetes, wherever that is, NiFi runs somewhere else and have them communicate and work on solving these uh, hard problems without too much difficulty. This multi-model server, as the name implies, can run multiple models at once. Very nice. And as you see, you could just point it to somewhere where the model is. It'll download, install it, get that all ready for you, and run as many as you want. You set your ports, connect to it, you're ready to go. I, I really like that. I'm using this other model for doing character level uh, analysis of data. This one has been trained to do analysis of uh, text and tell you, you know, what category it is. Again, this may be very useful if you're doing things with movies, television programs. But as you say, you're searching Twitter, looking to see if someone put a review out there for a new show. This can kind of categorize that and you can put all that data together. Further details on this are in a bunch of articles. I kind of linked them down the bottom. I sort of mentioned uh, this framework. This is the cleanest way I've seen and easiest for me to integrate with NiFi is this DJL framework. This sits on top of MXNet and other frameworks, makes it very clean and easy to write some code in Java to run you know, classification, pretty simple. And I've got links to that. And I'll show you this running. It's fast, easy, native to Java. If you're doing Java, take a look at this. Uh, very nice there. Now, I've done these talks before at different Apache cons, at different events. I've got these linked to the slides. Got links to all the other content. Makes it very easy to uh, learn as much as you want there. Hopefully, contribute, add your own things. I mentioned OpenNLP, it's integrating pretty reasonably. They have some downloadable models that you can use that have been trained. Most of them uh, focused around US English. There's others out there. It's definitely uh, room for people to build more in different languages, different uh, regions. I wrote a processor out there, again, with warnings. I wrote this pretty quickly, haven't really touched it in a while. Uh, so support is if you write to me, I'll uh, help you out. If you see enough there, we want to make our own project. The more committers, the better. It's all open source. Uh, within NiFi, when I run this, this will pull out all those entities it finds, whether it's locations, whether it's uh, names of people, entities, money. That can be very useful for a lot of applications especially as perhaps part of your uh, data learning pipeline, whether you're pulling data in or sending it to uh, applications that's going to use it or a dashboard. This can happen when the data is loading or while you're uh, processing it. Gives you some options there. You don't have to wait. You don't have to stop while you're doing this. This can happen in stream. And again, this same code, because it's Java, I can run it from Pulsar function, Flink. Java, Spark, lots of options there, pretty straightforward. Again, another tool that has so many different purposes. Apache Tika, whether it's running as part of your own Java app or as its own server, can do a lot. Now, I've got the processor with a really bad name. Again, hasn't been super validated. I love some people to maybe... Uh, give some uh, pull requests on that, runs in NiFi, uses Tika to convert 
from one data format to raw text. And that's really helpful for me because I like text because I could use that in regular streaming applications. So I could pull it out, pull out the whole document. Maybe that's one event or each line is an event. I'll show you an example there. That really depends on you. If I'm going to send the whole text to say Apache Solar, maybe I'll keep it together. But if I want to send chunks of data, maybe cleaned up sentences or parts of sentences and use that in uh, regular tables or in a database, maybe I'll pull out individual lines. Makes uh, for very interesting data processing pipelines. Like maybe I'm reading through a whole volume of old documents looking for company names, looking for people names, you know, whatever it is, you could automate a lot of this. Makes it pretty interesting applications there. We mentioned that DJL. Uh, what's cool now is there are some deep learning uh, frameworks out there for working with more than just images or videos or uh, other things. I can also work with, uh, you know, text here. I'm doing sentiment analysis. And I was also doing something that's really cool. If you haven't seen Bert out there, uh, Bert lets you do question and answer. So you could set up, you know, questions on the text coming in. That's pretty cool. Now, it depends on how well you trained, if it matches up well with the pre-trained BERT model. You know, it's, it's you know, whether something's AI or not, it's your own opinion, but it, it does pretty, pretty good. There was a question if the slides are available. Uh, I will make sure they're available uh, today. I'll put them in my GitHub, which uh, I'll post within this, and I'll make sure it's tweeted out there, and I'll put it in the uh, pop-in chats out there. Uh, I can put that that quick quick link out there so you can find it right now. Actually, it's in there right now. Yeah, I did post it there. I don't know if you could see that. It's in the chat, the person asking the question. I'll just put it in there. No, I can't answer it. But it that is this right here, Deep Learning, uh, 302 under T-SPAN HW. That has the source code. I'll put the slides there, make it easy for you. And again, all the slides have links to other content, whether it's around NI5, Pulsar, other stuff. But let's go into some code. You know, it's nice to see uh, text, but let's see some code. Okay, this is, I was running some Flink SQL. Let's get into uh, showing why NiFi is good for these sort of things. Now, you need to get data. If you're running a data pipeline to feed some uh, machine learning or deep learning to train it, you need to get data in. NiFi does that really well, and it does it even if it's hard. Like here, I'm going to uh, grab data, which you might be doing manually now because the steps here, or maybe you're doing it with a shell script or some funky code. I'm calling a REST endpoint, but that's not REST. That's really just downloading a file. It's a zip file. Then I'm going to unzip it. Then I'm going to unpack it. And then I'm going to throw away some of the files that I don't like. I'm throwing away the ones that aren't airports. And then I'm going to take each file that's XML. It's really RSS. It's kind of XML. Convert that to JSON because I'd rather look at JSON. And I'm getting rid of ones that don't have a valid location in it. Mm, that's not good data to me. Again, just doing that validation. Here I've got this stopped. I could start and stop each part of my code real time because NiFi has a uh, configurable queue here. And I could see the data while it's waiting for me to process it. And we could see here, you know, this was the name of the file, the size. Pretty useful information, a unique ID on it, some of the attributes, you know, where it's temporarily stored, what's the mime type, dates on it, where I got it from, you know, that's that original URL. And I could actually see the data as well if I want. And I could see that it's a big JSON string, which is fine. 
So we go back here and we could see I'm going to split those records out. And then I'm just going to send them to Pulsar. Again, it's up to you what you want to do with them. Sending them to Apache Pulsar is pretty useful for me. And I've got these all in JSON. I'm going to send all these different uh, weather reports from around the country. This control rate is to make it go slower. Uh, it might not be something you think of, but some some services down there will crash if you send too much information at once. NiFi is really fast. Maybe I'm running a NiFi cluster with 20 nodes. That can break things. We don't want to break things. Slowing it down. Here, I've got that limiter on here. Just so you can see data processing. Weather reports only happen every 15 minutes. If I grab all the data, this will process in two to three seconds. Doesn't make for a great demo. I like to you to be able to see data coming through the system in a reasonable thing. That's kind of simulating the speed there, but it, it's too fast to watch. So you can see I sent the data here. If there was any kind of errors or results, it would tell me nothing failed. I could have it automatically retry if I needed to, uh, but the data is getting pushed to Pulsar. Pretty straightforward. Sending that in for weather data. Now, I have another one. No, that's in the same place. Okay, let's go to the next one. Okay, this is the one I was mentioning. This is looking at a directory of my uh, presentations. I should put these two that I did today at ApacheCon. I'll download them and put them in there. Those will be PDF or PowerPoint. This will read it. I fetch it, grab some metadata. This is that Tika processor I mentioned. It's going to output text. Could output HTML. Uh, text is, makes more sense for me. You can look here. What was the last couple it looked at? This was uh, my flank talk about flank. And I could take a look and see what is. This is that uh, one page. Uh, pre or very short presentation. This is just the text. Took out all the formatting and images. Didn't really care about it. Here I split that text. I extract it. You know, get the uh, individual lines. And these are being processed. You can see the name of the uh, file. And it's grabbing one line at a time. Again, that was an option we mentioned. Uh, here I'm running that NLP processing on it. As you can see, it was doing a lot of them. Uh, and here we pulled out some attributes. Didn't find, I don't think that's a real date. I mean, sometimes it's a little off. There's a lot of different formats for dates. NLP is uh, not an exact science, <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, you can make sure. Free food. I wonder what, that, <laughs> what article, where I use that, or if that was some hidden text somewhere. Very interesting. Yeah, that's part of uh, GitHub there. You know, not all the data is interesting, but it's all being processed. Ah, David, I found your name in a talk. Now you owe me a dollar. So, yeah, this is, what line was this? Oh, that's probably his processor or his book. Yeah, David has a really nice book that just came out on Pulsar. Probably mentioned that here. Here I'm doing that sentiment analysis. Another thing that you could do with a lot of different frameworks I'm doing that with DJL in one place, Core NLP somewhere else. Uh, we didn't get much sentiment on it. Some of the uh, lines are not very interesting. You know, what can you do? Clean up the attributes, grab all that metadata you saw me adding, and then I'm going to convert it into a document, do a query on it. Here I'm looking at the sentiment with a couple different calcite queries. Uh, if it's good or neutral, I'm going to push it to solar. If it's bad, send it somewhere. I don't know what bad data would be. But this is just an example. I could send it somewhere else. If you told me, Tim, uh, I put all my documents in Mongo. Well, that's nice for you. Well, let's do that. So I could just grab that live data, push it to Mongo, set a couple parameters here and have it go to Mongo. Again, a nice reason why I use this for any of my uh, deep learning or machine learning flows. And that's just running as it's doing more processing. Uh, we might want to show some things that are more deep learning friendly. So here I have 
perhaps a messy flow. Uh, what I'm doing here is looking for uh, things from an SFTP server. And I've got those parameters. This one is, I don't know, it's a local one, 183. I think that's over here. Oh, let's see, 183. So this guy is here. Let's run this guy so we get some more. This is a camera hooked up to an Xavier box over there somewhere. He's running some uh, some flows over there. Let's see where uh, he is. So he's going to get new images. They're going to start showing up. What's nice with this is it's not going to grab any of the old ones. It has a link to what was the uh, previous runs, when it ran it, what's the most recent ones. So it doesn't reload things. Now, if you wanted to rerun, especially if you're building things, you may be building new uh, testing things. You could just go to state here, stop the processor and clear it out, and then it'll grab all the files there. Here, I'm just building that name up from the path and that file name. And here, I'm going to actually request that file. It's going to grab that file. This is my uh, deep learning processor. It's using ResNet 50. Again, you saw that was configurable, different models. I'm just going to run once here. And we'll see here, I get a valid one. And when it's done, I'm going to push it to a Slack channel. Again, that's up to you what you want to do with it. I also sent it over here to call my model. Now, I've got an MXNet model server running here. because I'm going to send this to CAFE. If we look... On the command line here, I have uh, that one running. You can take a look at the uh, the logs here for that model server. Uh, it's, it's not doing too much there. Each call does a little bit. Could also show you how I can test this. Again, you don't have to use NiFi. Could use this from a, a script. Pretty straightforward. I run uh, the model call over there. Gives me the results as text and there's a couple different ways to call uh call those uh, i have that in the code so you don't have to like guess how you do it yeah, this one is testing text just to show you that that crate model pretty quickly now if i can call that same one with this uh invoke http again i probably should have made that a uh remote earl you probably make things uh, parameters just so you could reuse them. You're smarter. So I'll just have this run. We get the response back when it's done. As you saw, it takes a couple seconds there. If you put it on a beefier machine, slides will be in that GitHub as soon as this talk is over. I'm going to, I will download them right now. And then I'll upload that PDF when the talk's over. I don't know. We want to upload that during the talk. That's kind of meta. Maybe it's cool. I don't know. Maybe at the end while we're while we're wrapping it up, if there's any more questions there. So this is the metadata because I ran it through deep learning twice. Once was that uh, deep learning uh, processor that I wrote, and you could see it put a bunch of metadata here. This is where it wrote and described where a bounding box is around the image. There's the classifications. I think it's the camera that's right here pointing at my head. So today, thought I was a person. That's cool. It doesn't always identify me right. I don't know if my head's a little sh weird shaped. I don't know. 95% confidence. Pretty good. Now that image is stored on that NVIDIA device over there. And I FTP'd it over. I could have put a Minify agent over there. I could have put Pulsar, a lot of different things I could put there. I kind of mix and match different things, trying out uh, ones that make sense for what I'm doing. Really depends. Yeah, there's the results of that call. I don't know what it thinks I have on my head there, but yeah, I'm going to upload those slides here and I'll put a description. And then when Apache posts the uh, video, I'll have it here as well. This is uh, where I put all my talks. Let me put that in the chat. I saw you did it in Q&A. I can't put answers there, so that's in uh, the chat portion. So that is one way. Remember I said we sent it to Slack. You can look at Slack. 
Here's that post. It's fully customizable, and I could put an image in there if I want as well. Nice way to have your pipeline maybe notify someone, hey, this just ran. Hey, this just ran. Maybe do a sampling. You might not want to send every single one. You know, up to you. Here I'm doing it if uh, if the file size is reasonable. If it was a really small image, it doesn't make sense to send it. I don't know if I configured this. Let's run this and see if that worked. No, I don't have that configured yet. I can push the image to uh, Slack channel as well, but I need to set up uh, uh, some settings on that. I didn't do that. It's just lazy. Uh, so yeah, so there's different ways to do this. So if as new images come in, because I'm running uh, over here, I'm running... Uh, it just took my picture. I still had a blue highlight. So this is a a deep learning uh, model from NVIDIA running on a Xavier. I have that code running in a Python script in a loop. It uh, runs their model. When it's done, it sends it to Pulsar. So I've got all that metadata with it, and that's sitting in a in a uh, in that stream native console you saw sitting in a topic as well as creating that image and that image when that image shows up as you see here the the list ftp just saw those four new ones come up i build the right file name and now we've got a couple of new ones here i'm going to get rid of some of these so we can see what the newer ones look like We'll see if it's getting a good view of my head. It may be, it may be not. You know, as that's running, let's see if it has a good idea of me cash machine. Uh, it may be grabbing part of uh, the other device there. I'm curious who it thinks I am. I'm a cell phone. Very interesting. So if we take a look at the, the image that came through. I'm curious what it's getting a picture of. And if I'm already a machine, uh, maybe all the other junk in the side of my room, maybe this is my uh, microphone. I don't know. Maybe you should focus on my head, mister. Maybe I am a person. But we'll see. Just to show you as part of that pipeline, we're getting images in too. I'm sending them to the uh, deep learning, whether it's through uh, the model server or the built-in processor. Both are pretty quick. As a point of reference, I'm running an average power book here. It is running NiFi locally. It's running Pulsar locally. It's running the model server locally. And uh, it's also running, uh, you know, any of these other processes plus Hopin plus Gmail. So it's, it's a little busy on this machine. So it's not super fast. Obviously, if you're running this in uh, a regular cluster, you're going to get better performance. But I like to keep it close. If we were live, I would have this maybe having people volunteer from the crowd. I'm going to take a picture of something in the room. You know, hopefully next year we'll be in person. I hope we get to go back to uh, New Orleans. I hope uh, that the city will be okay and they'll be doing conferences again. That was a great place to have conferences. But uh, we'll, we'll see what we could do. So that one is running, you know, as new images come up. I'm going to stop this. That's enough images for today. We got that set through here. Let's see how my uh, machine is running there on the Jetson. Should be starting to slow down as I've stopped uh, running that deep learning on there. Just to give you an idea what's going on. Do I see any more questions? Not much else there. So we'll take a look at some of the uh, side things we were doing in there. So we had that deep learning happening. Again, not much for you to use this. As linked in the uh, slides, this is one of the uh, processors that I built for NiFi. You could use DJL as a separate Java app. The code is very straightforward to do any of these pre-built models. As you see here, this was just doing the ResNet 50. You could adjust some of the parameters depending on, you know, what version you're doing. If your models change a lot, which they might, 
you may want to use a model server. And here I'm running uh, the uh, multi model server from the MXNet uh, community. And this is cool as I put the name of the models I want and link to the model. These could be ones I have locally, or I could have a link to them. These are ones that Amazon put out there as examples, Cafe Net and uh, CREPE. I don't want to call it creep, crap, creepy. I don't know. <laughs> what, crepe, whichever it is, all those sound good. And then I have some server configuration here. Not much, but it might be something of interest to you. I like to put in a different port because I'm running some things that are using the same ports. I don't want collisions there. So those are the ports I'm using. And it's going to have the URL is what you specify here. Pretty straightforward to do that, to run your model server as the logging in there. Nice way to do it. Again, you could write a processor like I did. Use a couple of them that I've built. I have uh, a couple here. Uh, one is for, we saw there, I got a couple of versions. This one is for doing the BERT QA, which is a pretty cool one. Uh, this one's for sentiment analysis. And I've got an MXNet one for object detection. These are all really examples for you to extend, you know, work on the source code, add your own model there. Make your decision. Do I want to run a model through Tika? Do I want to run it through the model server? Do I want to run it through a commercial model server? Uh, run it through uh, Java processor, run it in Flink. You've got a lot of options. The easiest way, I think, is, is this uh, style here where I'm calling that model server so I can play around with new models very easily and just run them locally and then figure out if I want or if I need to make it more production oriented by setting up a cluster, setting up a model server cluster, or putting it in as custom processors. Lots of options there. There's a lot of flexibility in the system. Depends on what you want to do. Again, I like this because now I've got the response here. I could turn this into other code. Or I could just take this as separate uh, separate rows. I may want to do an update record on here to add an ID, to add a timestamp, maybe some metadata that I have. Because if you look at the attributes in NiFi that I have for this call, I can grab any of these and add these as fields. I can update the record to have like this unique ID. Uh, the host that I ran it from, the name of the image that I processed, you know, maybe this analysis from my other way of doing it, you know, the probabilities, ranks, you know, maybe where it put the uh, thing around it, file size, classification, different classes. Uh, that may be important to me. So you might want to do that. It's really up to you what you want to do there. You know, you have a couple of options. Again, I could also uh, send this to another uh, system. Lots of options. Any more questions out there? Not seeing any more questions. I will keep going through uh, some different demo here just to give you an idea in the system. Now, the one thing I could do here is now that I've got this response, part of my data pipeline is, you know, running that classification, why'd I run it? Well, maybe this is the front of my store. Maybe this is in a certain area. And I want to do something if there is a, a high probability of something being there. You know, maybe I'm waiting for a delivery. Maybe I'm waiting for uh, a process on a factory line. Certain color comes up. I want to do something. This data, I may send all of it to Pulsar. And then have uh, a Flink SQL over here that's running against that to do my uh, alerts. And the result of that Flink SQL could be sent to another topic that could have a consumer in a mobile app or in a dashboard to say, hey, these six uh, items arrived or just do a count. You know, I could do stateful processing on this data as it comes through. Hey, I've got a million... Uh, 
blue boxes have arrived. Maybe that's important. Maybe that's not. You know, it depends on what you're doing with the system. You know, pretty easy. The, the combination of these different uh, Apache tools makes it very straightforward. Like I mentioned, uh, I really like the uh, NLP processor. The Tika one does a lot. Because uh, that data we had coming in here for text, this is pulling out all of the text from different types of files. I mean, for this one, we could take a look at the name of the file. And this pulled it out of a PDF. So being able to take text out of a PDF, pretty powerful. Tika can also pull out graphics and charts there, depending on what you want to do with your code. Very useful here. I'm going to stop this. Uh, I should drop in that new PDF that I downloaded from my other talk, but I didn't do that yet. I'm going to download this other talk from earlier. So as soon as we're done, I'm going to upload those so you get them. You know, just so you have that. Let's run another through the system. And you can see here it's running. This means it has one process running, one active thread. And then if I wanted to, I could kill it while it's running. Don't recommend it, then you wouldn't uh, get your results. Not going to break anything, though. Here is the most recent one I just ran. Let's see what it gave me here. There's a bounding box. Again, me. This should be a video of the side of my head. Let's see. Yes. As you see, it thought I was a person. This guy didn't draw the box too well. I don't know which one was it. Who did who first? Like, does it think the stuff on the wall is a person? I don't know. <laughs> We'd have to see there. But it's an interesting process. So we'll, uh, we don't have many more questions. I, oh. Is there a way to run the NIFI REST API against a secured? Now, if you see here, I'm logged in. This is secured. Do you want... You're saying if you want uh, REST coming in? Yeah, if you have, let's see if I have one. I don't know if I have one running right now. We'll see. Oh, maybe I do. Yeah, it, I can have NiFi listen in on SSL. So I can have my SSL there. I can also add passwords if you want to do it that way. If you're talking about uh, NiFi input ports, from remote connections, when I set these up, I can add SSL. That's part of the configuration settings. Like if, if someone's trying to uh, call those, you know, if you're going through NIFI site to site, if you're going as an HTTP listener, I can have it one SSL and two is I can have uh, passwords there. I can also, uh, because you're in full control of these things programmatically, let's see if I have a good one here. Yeah, I guess just listen is my only option. You can also listen as uh, FTP or SFTP. They added that recently. But I can have whatever data comes in here, I could just throw it away. I could require that you pass in a certain header with a parameter. I could have it required... Uh, Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. If you want to use the NIFI command line interface, it could start and stop things. It could do a full login. If you look at the NIFI toolkit, the NIFI CLI part, uh, when you go in here, you can log in. Right? And you could set that in, as you see here, if you want to do it through a, a trust or a key so you don't have to, like, pass parameters in that way. Yeah, you could have it fully secured for starting, stopping things, you know, loading new things. Yeah, if you've got a secured instance, whether it's through uh, Kerberos or something else, yeah, you can, your security configuration is, uh, is there for the command line or for the rest. I think it's a little easier to... Uh, put the rest, uh, the command line interface to going through rest. And again, you're probably going to do that through Kerberos or LDAP. That makes it pretty, uh, that's probably the best way to do it. 
if you've got an unsecured cluster, obviously that's a lot easier. Yeah, pretty straightforward. Uh, I think I have some articles on that. And again, that, that could be something that's part of your standard uh, pipeline. I, I have seen it work. I haven't done running this in a DJL in a Spark cluster recently. It's been a while, but this is a pretty new article. And this, is this the right library? Let me make sure that looks like the right library. Mm, that looks right. Yes, this is the right library. Oh, look how, yes. Uh, from what I've seen, it runs really well. It runs well in the NiFi one. I'd be surprised if it didn't run awesome in the uh, Spark one. Spark is a great library for running these. Uh, as you can see in this relatively recent article, you could do some pretty cool stuff here. On uh, This one's got some NVIDIA specific things in there, but that really depends on the libraries you're using. Uh, they make it uh, so you don't have to use the CUDA ones if you're on a non-NVIDIA. But if you are, you can take advantage of uh, CUDA, so it'll take advantage of your GPU. Again, nice if you're running on a Jetson or Xavier or on, you know, a big cluster. Again, if you don't have GPUs with your Spark cluster, not a big deal. But, yeah, that's out there. Uh, I might You might want to ask in a Spark session for a deeper dive on that. But, yeah, it's designed to run pretty well in different environments. Uh, as you saw, it's in Spark 3. I haven't tried it with Spark 3, but that should run really nice. Again, there might be some people in one of the Spark sessions who played around with it. It's uh, it's a newer framework, but I like it a lot. It's, uh, it's worked really well. Like I said, running this in NiFi, I haven't, uh, haven't seen it crash unless I'm really doing some stupid things, which could happen. You know, if you send it no image, you might want to check that you're, uh, if you're sending an image in or not. But yeah, that's that same code in here. If you ran that code in, uh, I find my app quickly. Oh, uh, let's see. Let's see. Yep. Here it is. Now this is all in there. It's, the code is so simple. It runs in a NiFi cluster to run in a Spark one, a Flink one. Uh, it, it's really clean code. Uh, yeah, this one I'm calling from the processor, taking in some parameters, taking in the image. Most of this is boilerplate code that they put out there. I didn't have to do too much custom. Just pass in the image, what kind of uh, model I'm using, run the prediction. Only thing that's really specific for me was grabbing all the different parameters and putting them in an object that I could use very easily in a NiFi processor. So am I in the right one? No, processor. Yeah, this is uh, pretty standard for NiFi processor. I just pass those parameters in, grab the image from the flow file, do the predict. Now, if you're doing that with Spark, you probably want to make sure the images are either in S3 or in HDFS so you could reference them via URL because having those in the Spark cluster where you happen to be running could be tricky. Now, if you're doing it for uh, text processing, obviously that's a lot easier. Uh, otherwise, you, I've done this on uh, Cloudera's uh, Jupyter Notebook where you've had to encode the images as either uh, MIME encoding or UU encoding so you can make the rest call and that gets a little messy and if the image is too big, do you really want to do that? could slow down your calls. Having it in somewhere like HDFS or S3 makes that a lot easier. Again, depends on what you're doing. Here you can see where I'm setting all those attributes. You know, I could add more to that, but this one works out pretty well for me. And then I output a new image. I do it as PNG. I don't know why. I, I guess I could have kept the J, JPEG. I don't know. PNG seems like a nicer format. Then I add all those attributes back, sends it back. 
and then we have the results here. So, I mean, it's pretty straightforward code there. If you wanted to do a different model, if you wanted to do it differently, this is a good place to start from. Not, uh, you know, the best production code in the world, but it works pretty well and shows you a paradigm for how you can uh, use the, uh, the deep learning processor. Uh, keep watching the updates. I should update this. There's some new releases of uh, DJL and they've added some new features. Some things they have are nice are automatically detecting the platform. And if you have GPU, you know, or if you don't want to use MXNet, you could choose to pick between different models. Now, if you look uh, at the sentiment one, I have, uh, where's a QA? One of these lets you pick between different uh, frameworks. Uh, if you want to run it with MXNet or you want to run it with TensorFlow or you want to run it with PyTorch, that's pretty cool. Uh, you might want to try it with uh, one and then you switch over to the next one. And then you say, okay, this, this runs better with, uh, like at one point, PyTorch was a lot better. So I switched to running uh, the, the BERT one for just PyTorch because that had the best uh, BERT model. Again, that could change. Probably should have made that a parameter. And, uh, you know, something you could do if you're writing your own here. But again, pretty straightforward. This one's easier because I don't have to pass in an image. And that might be something you move to a Spark cluster. Uh -uh, do I see anything else? No, I guess I'll uh, get going so the next person can get uh, ready. Thanks for attending. Uh, my session tomorrow, I have a couple of talks. Um, I have Smart Transit. It's real time with Flink. NiFi and Pulsar, and also an AI edge application. We got some Jetsons running with Pulsar. I've got Go, Python, Java out there. Uh, probably some NiFi and Flink in there as well. So uh, if you can't attend, it's about the same time tomorrow as it was today, maybe a little bit earlier. If not, there's some cool sessions on Pulsar. Thanks for joining. I'll see you uh, later, and I'll make sure I post all those slides to so get them, and I'll put them in Hoppin' and in Twitter. Thank you.